Hi guys, Rap Critic here, and this was a request by Anthony Smith. And if you'd like to request a song, album, or movie for me to review for a one-time donation, hit up my Kofi in the link tree below. So let's talk about The Far Side. Yes, thank you, editor person. I'm sure the audience will sing their praises for this very relevant reference. No, I mean The Far Side with a PH. An early 90s West Coast rap group known for laid-back jazzy beats and light-hearted rhymes during a time when the West Coast was being pigeonholed as just the hardcore street shit. Now, I mainly knew them for their two biggest hits, dropped from their second album with the backwards music video, and today's song Passes Me By, a beloved classic about unrequited love from the different perspectives of each rapper. And as much as I enjoyed these songs and the different kind of energy they came with as MCs, I was never really able to get into them beyond the surface singles. And I had forgotten the exact reason why. That is, until I had to listen to their first album for this review. And was quickly reminded of their very first single, Ya Mama. A song which is unfortunately the true indicator of what a good chunk of most of their music is actually like. Your mom is so fat. Your mama is so big in fact that she can get busy with 22 burritos. Like, the song's supposed to be about running the dozens and making fun of someone's mom, because as I mentioned earlier, Far Side's appeal was that they had a more fun loving, jokey aspect of their music than most. But personally, I I gotta just say it plain, they're they're just flat out not that funny to me. I'm thinking about your mother doing bogey bit. Yeah, this is the caliber of your mama jokes they're going for here. Uh, oh, uh, got him, I guess. Like, these ain't exactly a cavalcade of knee slappers they're packing here. And there's plenty of consistently funny rappers from the time you can still go back to. Like Red Man, Method Man, Digital Underground, where their humor still stands up despite being from the same era. So it can't be an early 90s thing. And I can enjoy a good roasting song. Like, it's not perfect, but I'd go to bat for Lookin' Boy by Hot Styles as a hood novelty classic of the 2000s. Because it manages to pull some cheap laughs out of you from the pop culture references and the delivery and timing of the jokes. Oh, hell, hell, I need love, look at what I can't get in the club, look at what I remember me from school, hell. Now you get no love, look at what. But I'm just not sure what I'm supposed to find funny about this. You would beat my set for a little wrong. In some right back box of drawers. Oh, you said my mom beatbox for a famous singer while wearing bright red boxers. I, oh no, C called my bluff, I guess. What's this even supposed to mean? I, is it even supposed to be a this? Cause uh, I'm more confused than insulted. And I'm not kidding, so much of their first album is filled with these goofy jokes that just sound like rejected bits from Richard Pryor's early Chitlin circuit days. How the hell did this get a pass in 1992? And I can enjoy a freewheeling, freestyle album if it's entertaining enough, but the jokes on this album are so scattershot and straight up childish, a lot of it honestly feels like comedy rap for fourth graders. You know that kind of humor where you just kind of have to think being immature and random in and of itself is funny? And packed with the most meandering skits too. I, I swear there's like three of them before you even get to track seven. It's just an inexplicably frustrating listen. I was so gobsmacked by how thoroughly I didn't enjoy the rest of this album, I legit had to go back and listen to Passing Me By again, just to make sure I actually still liked it. And you know, with all that said, Passing Me By is still an untouchable fucking classic. Like, just to temper the old school hip hop heads and their 15 year old born in the wrong generation nephews, I'll say up front I give this song my personal break the scale 6 out of 5 star rating for just how incredible this song is. And, you know, for how arbitrary any rating system may be, I do like to take care to preserve the highest honor for songs that are just this good. Songs that capture an emotion so succinctly that they transcend time and can still reconnect you to the visceral reality of that feeling they're describing. Like, in the one way that the actual Far Side album this is from as a whole feels like a journey through the mind of a fourth grader's puerile sense of humor, this song places you right in that fourth grader's mind when he sees his first crush, and all the awkward, uncomfortable, stomach full of bubbling emotions you have to deal with when trying to work out your feelings for them. Now, I'll admit a bias here, because in addition to it always hitting that emotional pitch for me, this song especially has a place in my heart due to the immediate sampling chain tie-in it has to one of my favorite R&B rap remix songs from the early 2000s, Stutter by Joe featuring Mystical. Specifically because for me it was the first song I could remember where an R&B song sampled the melody of a rapper's lyric. Like, of course, the backing music for both songs contained the same dual Quincy Jones Jimi Hendrix sample. And also there's like a smorgasbord of other samples woven into this Far Side song that didn't just take too much time to point out. But it was always interesting to me that Joe, for his remix, also used a part of one of the actual rap verses. My dear, my dear, my dear, you do not know me, but I know you very well. Now let me tell you about the feelings I've been for you when I try. 
far as I could ever find, that's an original melody Fat Lip made up for his verse. And it always stuck out to me as really cool for a neo-soul singer to sample an original melody from a rap song, altering it to fit it into a new R&B melodic riff. You know, before a lot of boring people would drain the magic out of the novelty of doing that. But to bring it back, the sample work here lays the perfect sound bed for the song's subject matter, which is just such a universally understandable topic. Because we were all young at one point and had a first crush we didn't know how to talk to, right? Either because you've got no experience, you're not confident, or you just don't know what to say. And each verse feels like they're unspooling all the angst and frustration over the respective girl they wish they could talk to, dropping glaringly truthful contemplations about their shy, self-conscious feelings. I have been going as far as asking if I could get with her. I just played love by ear and hope she gets the picture. What is the apple of my eye? Overlook and disregard my feelings no matter how much I try. Like, even right in the middle of him lamenting why he can't be with her, he has a self-reflective moment addressing his own inaction about actually trying to talk to her. Wait, no, why did not really pursue my little princess with persistence? That I was so lucky that she was unaware of my existence from a distance I desired. Of course, the first verse places you squarely in that grade school feeling, with it being about having a crush on a teacher. When I went to school, I carry lunch in the bag with the apple for my teacher, cause I knew I get a kiss. And that's a particularly awkward subject matter to bring up, but you know, the kids are dealing with raging hormones, they can't help who they're attracted to, you know, it happens. Thankfully though, the rapper makes it clear that this is a one-sided infatuation, not unlike the other verses. As Booty Brown, the rapper in the verse, tries to set up excuses for him to be closer to her. I would raise my hand to make a snack of my desk and help me with my problems, it was never much. Just a chick to smell his and try to sneak a touch. And you know, there's a bit of a squeaky lyric there that sounds like he's considering actually trying to touch the teacher inappropriately. But within the context of it being a young kid who'd definitely get expelled if that actually happened, I don't think the implication is that it's something he's actually going to do. I figured through the lingering delivery of his voice in the next line, the implication is it's a sense of longing for that daydream fantasy in his head. The yearning to have the confidence to make some kind of a move. Oh, wow, I wish I could hold a hand and give her a hug. While also feeling kind of sour about the guy who does get to be with the person you're pining over. She was married to the man, he was a thug, his name was Lee, he drove a seat, she had a man, he was a Rudy suit, a Nick and Poop. Also, I just love the general idea of the word nincompoop being in a rap song, like that word just doesn't get used nearly as much relative to how fun it is to say. But yeah, ultimately the rappers all come to accept and understand that these crushes just were not meant to be. And each verse ends a little different, with Slim Kid 3's verse ending by finally getting over his anxiety and actually making his feelings known. Although she's crazy stepping, I try and stop the stride cause I won't have no more of this passive vibe. And Fat Lip's verse ends with him mustering the guts to make a bold declaration of his feelings through a note he passes to the girl he likes. Wider, a letter, together, and it was my dear, my dear, my dear, you do not know me but I know you very well now let me tell you about the feelings I've been for you when I try. The infamous lyrics themselves personifying through their pain delivery that desperate search to find just the right words to make someone truly understand the way you feel about them, in the hopes that the laying out of the depths of your devotion will inspire them to reciprocate how you feel about them. Damn, I wish I wasn't such a wimp, cause then I would let you know that I love you so when I your man, then I would beat you. But then he has to face the rejection, and it sucks, and it hurts. For the time to tell the one who loves you dearly, cause he has loved me tender, but the letter came back three days later, we turned to cinder. Damn. But at the same time, hey, you know, at least you got your answer, and you can move on with your life knowing that this relationship isn't a no-go because you're a coward or because she just isn't aware of how loyal you'd be to her, but because she just wasn't that into you in the first place. And it's a harsh pill to swallow of dealing with someone's romantic indifference in the context of you laying out your passionate desire for them, but the acceptance of those who don't feel for you like you do for them is a reality you have to learn to live with, as the other rappers exemplify with how they end their verses. It's a pained but graceful acceptance of rejection, the type of attitude that ultimately makes you a better person in the long run, as the verses lead into the solemnly resolved declaration on the hook. Like I said, the song's an unmitigated classic that I can easily see being the soundtrack for unrequited loves for years to come, or just as a musical encasing in amber of the sappy, vulnerable ways those old crushes used to make you feel. And then, just to remind you, it's the far side, they end with a gross, gravelly belch right at the tail end of such a beautiful song. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> just needed to be there, huh? Well, that's the episode. Leave a like if you liked because it helps, comment if you have something to say because it helps even more, and hit the subscribe button and the bell afterwards because the bell is what actually alerts you to new episodes. And if you want to keep up with everything I'm doing, check out my link tree for Twitch streams, merch, movie and album review podcasts, and any other stuff I'm up to. So check all that fun stuff out and I'll catch you next time. Peace.